Thank you so much for joining me on WCIA TV. And Daniel, I have to tell you, as a former speech pathologist, my first question that I wanna ask you is, tell me about dropping that British accent and how you became Fred Hampton. Um, the, dropping the British accent is, you know, I just let it go. <laughs> I just kind of, <laughs> when I see the lines, I can't do the lines in it. London accent. I just can't do it in that. So I just go, I can only do it in this way. So then I just do it in that way. And then, and then I've got to build my confidence and my um, uh, knowledge on the accents and where that accent comes from. The accent isn't just how you sound, it's how you think, you know, and how you feel about yourself and what you believe. And so you have to adopt all those kinds of things and understand all those kinds of things and take that in so that the accent is more embedded within you. You know, it's like, I would say the way you like moved your head there is part of your accent and dialect of where you come from, you know? that you've, that's a choice. You may not be aware that you made that choice, but you probably got that from your friends growing up or your mom or your dad or your uncle, your aunties. It's like, that's all a reflection of that. So that's how I kind of see um, building an accent. Um, how much did you know about this, this person, this leader before the film? And then how did you research by, you know, uh, films, footage, articles, or maybe even talking with family members? I knew a minimal amount. I remember I saw the, um, his date of birth and his date of um, uh, of his assassination, and I was like, "How old is he?" Like, yeah. chairman, I was like, "How old is he?" And I remember going on a Wikipedia hunt. This is way before I had the project, and it was even that. I went on a Wikipedia hunt. I go, "Who is this chairman, Fred? Like, what what happened? Did, like, did it, I knew of him. I was just like, what happened? I didn't know that. I haven't. Why have I haven't I heard that? So I knew I knew about that. But and then coming to the project. I just read a lot of um, the books on the Black Panther reading list, you know, in order to be a fully fledged Panther, you have to do six weeks of political education. So I read books on that, uh, read books, a majority of books on that. And then um, went to Chicago, took myself to Chicago and um, went to Maywood and went to like all these places that he's from, like where he used to speak at, where he used to go to school, where he's, his old homes and speak to the people out there, speak to what he means to people out in Chicago, you know, in, in those areas. And then I would read things, dissertations and about the specific Chicago politics in the streets and in that world at that time. And would broaden my horizons and this is that and the other. Yeah, it was a, it was a number of things that I, that I did in order to build a universe, in order to be a vessel. I'm a Chicago film critic. So I'm really curious to ask you a little bit more deeply when you went to Chicago and talked with people in Maywood and around those areas, what was the sense that you got about Fred Hampton and their knowledge base and how they felt about him? Just how much of a light he was at such a young age in terms of um, as a 12, 13, 14 year old. You know, I think he, he got, he was on the, he was being watched by the FBI from 14 years old, you know, because of his incredible work with the junior NAACP, him, there's a there's a swimming pool named after him in in Chicago, that he did incredible work in order to get black people to to, to be there. It's like he did an amazing, at a very young age. That's what I really you know, at a very young age. He was clearly a leader and clearly just, um, not his age. You know, like uh, he, he he was a man on a mission. Um, and uh, and he had a purpose. What do you hope that perhaps your film, your character? and people's knowledge base is increasing about who Fred Hampton is and who the true Black Panthers are, will maybe change not just Chicago, but the United States. I feel for me, it's just um, can, to see that like, these are people that deeply, deeply love their community, you know, with healing the sick, with educating kids, with feeding kids, paying for legal aid. But um, all, anyone that had someone in prison, they would get buses and f like who couldn't afford to get to them, they would make sure that they got to them free of charge. They love their own, you know? And, and, and you can see the power of that is why we, me and you are having this conversation right now. You know, it's, um, and, and, and to, to lead from that kind of space, but also the incredible work they did with um, the Rainbow Coalition, Chairman Fred did with the Rainbow Coalition and finding points of interest with people that he was in conflict with and still uniting them without compromising his love for his own blackness and love for our own black community. Um, I think there's an, a number of things that are really incredible within this. Thank you so much for joining me to talk about Judas and the Black Messiah, which premieres in theaters and HBO Max on February 12th. Thank you. Thanks so much, Pamela.